during that time, the industry was facing um, states, some 18 states trying to pass laws which would mandate the use of a parental advisory logo, but not the handsome little black and white one uh, that we had been using voluntarily, but rather a large fluorescent sticker that had a list of sins ranging from bestiality and necrophilia to alcoholism and adultery. Um, we defeated the legislation in all 18 states, but we're told time and time again by those state legislators that if they didn't feel the um, voluntary standard parental advisory logo was working and working well, that they would come back with their state laws and they would press for passage of those state laws. So how come the censors have got this far? Why is the recording industry being blamed for antisocial behavior? Because the problems that face our youth today seem so insurmountable, uh, be it AIDS or teenage suicide or drug abuse, teen pregnancy, what have you, because those problems are so difficult to address and to begin to solve that people rather are looking for an easy way out and are looking for a scapegoat. And they are blaming rock music and they're blaming the arts. And that's unfortunate. Attempts to sticker and censor rock musicians have led to howls of outrage from anti-censorship groups. Suzanne Stefanak heads one such organization in San Francisco. I think the fact that the major labels are imposing um, labeling on some of their artists is fairly laughable. The criterion used are totally arbitrary. Um, I think they're of no use to the parents if that's who they're aiming them at. And in many cases, they serve as buying incentives for children who want to listen to something that their parents wish they wouldn't. But if you're, I mean, you can be opposed to labor, but surely la uh, labeling a record isn't censorship. Labeling is censorship because many of the major distributors have already said that they will not um, carry any albums that have a label that might be considered questionable. And if there is no distribution for the album, then the record labels aren't going to let them, uh, the um, artists record what they like. And so there is, in fact, a chilling effect and censorship. To add weight to their case, the opponents of rock have searched small-town America for individuals with powerful and emotive stories, which have provided the Christian fundamentalists with some of their most potent propaganda. When he was 16, John Tanner was an average high school student with a passion for Black Sabbath. One day he had a row with his girlfriend over the phone. After she hung up on him, he went to his room, put a shotgun to his head, and fired. All the days that I shot myself, I skipped out of school, and I just pretty much sat up my room all day and listened to, I don't know, Black Sabbath and Grand Funk and, uh, you know, I'd work myself into a state of mind that, you know, I was taking everything as really depressing and that evening about uh, 4.30 or so, I uh, got in an argument with my girlfriend on the phone and then I figured, you know, that, you know, that was it and went upstairs and uh, just grabbed my shotgun and put it up under my jaw and said, well, God, I'm coming home and hit the trigger. I'd never considered suicide, you know, until I was like about 15 and really started getting into rock and roll. And, uh, you know, songs like Killing Yourself to Live and stuff had just really... You know, I was taking all this to heart really, really, really much. I guess, I, you know, I'd have to say that, uh, that they did, you know, the, the words and stuff did have a big influence on me. And, uh, you know, like I said, too, you know, each person has control of their own, what they let influence them. But uh, at that time in my life, I'd, I was totally committed to listening to you know, listening to Black Sabbath, and I, you know, I really got off to him a lot. So when the kid mutilates himself, or murders, or rapes, or takes drugs, and then says, 
It was rock music that made me do it. Is there not a case to be answered? No, that poor kid had tremendous problems before, during, and after he was listening to rock music. I, I do not believe that a record can, f a re and a record alone, can force uh, young people to do some of the things that, that rock music in our industry is being blamed for today. Again, I think people are looking for scapegoats. You know, if your kid is sitting in his room listening to uh, the same record over and over for eight hours, I don't care what that record is, you might want to think about knocking on the door and saying, Johnny, is everything okay in there? Music can certainly influence our mood, enhance happiness or deepen sadness. But does the music actually create the mood? And is it directly responsible for actions related to that mood? Does music use us, or do we use the music? Look at me, Satan Jim Hardy is 20 years old. He's serving a life sentence without parole for murder. On the night of December the 6th, 1987, Jim drove to the woods with two school friends. There they met their victim, another classmate, Stephen Newbury. Using baseball bats, they beat Stephen to death, and then dumped his body into a water system. A few months later, the American media flocked to Jim's trial. As the murder was linked by many, to his involvement with Satanism and heavy metal music. We had planned it before, and we'd attempted to, to carry it out before, but we just lose the heart, or try it another time and lose the heart again. And finally this night, I guess we just, all the failures in the past, kind of gave strength to it this time. That night, we played some Venom on the way there, just to get us in the mood, I guess you could say. We let the music soup us up, or give us the courage to do it. You know, it, we allow the music to just carry us on through with the act. So if we were looking for something to justify what we were doing, or to justify the way we were acting, any of the lyrics would suggest something to us. We looked for those things. We looked for the lyrics that would justify what we were doing. Heavy metal was the chosen soundtrack for the death of Stephen Newbury. But does Jim really believe that it was the heavy metal music that drove him to murder in the first place? Uh, that's a cop-out to me. I mean, I really feel like that's a cop-out. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, <laughs> you know? It doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, that's just like some cattle roper getting drunk at the bar and find out his old lady's cheating on him and go out and kill up three or four people. You know, people are going to want to say, well, did country music make you kill that guy? You know, it's, I think that's just kind of a cop-out. I mean, sure, it might have given us the heart to do it, but it didn't cause us to do it. And I think that's the important question. It might be hard to believe that music can drive a teenager to commit suicide or even murder, but opponents of rock on both sides of the Atlantic are adamant and are willing to go to extraordinary lengths to prove their case. They claim that musicians are deliberately trying to lure their fans into evil by the use of hidden messages.